Sure. Thank you very much for having me again at uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Pint. It's been a while, maybe a few years since I've, yes, uh, yes. I was speaking, but actually I've joined from time to time. And um, then I would like to share with you my experience in um, designing uh, mechanical keyboards, specifically mini mechanical keyboards, uh, with Raspberry Pi RP2040 microcontroller. Uh, the agenda is actually quite broad. Uh, first of all, um, everything that I do uh, in, in, in the topic of hobby electronics and um, mechanical keyboards, including, uh, it's open source hardware. That's something that I do in my spare time. I do it for fun and profit because some of the things that I do uh, are being sold through distributors uh, and various online platforms. So I'm a huge open source enthusiast and uh, the benefit of the, doing my own hardware things is that I can make them open source hardware. So um, I've included a bunch of slides to promote open source hardware. Um, of course, we'll talk about uh, free and open source software tools for designing uh, open source hardware, basically the tools that I'm using. And um, uh, mechanical keyboards, what's so special about mechanical keyboards? And um, I'll show you how you can design your own mechanical keyboard based on my experience with uh, KiCad and how you can put um, a free and open source software on it, like uh, KMK, which uh, runs perfectly fine on RP2040. And of course, finally, we'll wrap it up with some conclusions. Um, how many of you are familiar with open source hardware? Can you raise your hands in, in Zoom? I'm not sure if I can see the results, even if you're sharing. All oh, right, some, some of you are. Okay, nice, really nice. Uh, so basically open source hardware is a similar concept to open source software, but it's about physical products. Uh, it gives confidence that the design will be available no matter if the individual who has designed it or the company manufacturing it uh, went out of business or for one reason or another, the person stops caring about us, this project. The schematics are there, the Gerber files are there. So you know that in worst case scenario, you can do it on your own or you can hire someone to manufacture it for you based on this open source hardware designs. Uh, the major benefit for us uh, like consumers is that open source hardware keeps uh, the prices low and fair. Pretty much you see the bill of materials and you know uh, what is the cost of the device? And if something that costs, let's say, you know, 50 US dollars in terms of bill of material is sold for several thousands of dollars, you say, hey, wait a minute, that's too expensive. I know that you have engineering costs to do it, but it's too much. I'm going to do it on my own. Furthermore, uh, with open source hardware, you can repair and maintain things because you have the schematics, you know how they work, you know what the components are used, and it's significantly easier to maintain them in the long term. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, many of you here in this group are familiar with retro computers, especially those that are pop popular in the UK, like Sinclair. And uh, I have a few Sinclairs as well. I've imported them from eBay uh, before Brexit, when it was easier to get things from, uh, from England to Bulgaria. And uh, it, I know how hard it is to maintain these, these computers. And uh, they're not open source hardware, but th there is a huge community. So people have reverse engineered them and there's so many hints how to improve them and how to make them. If, if nowadays we start making open source hardware things like 20, 30, 50 years later, people will be able to maintain them, to still modify them. Um, and uh, these uh, devices can have a really, um, really a long life. Uh, from business side of things, uh, open source hardware, cuts the road to market and enable customization and integration in third-party products. So if you're, you're working on a very sophisticated professional system, you may want to use open source hardware for certain components of the system. And this could save you time and money uh, to move on forward. The, basically, the whole idea is that it's about sharing knowledge, educating students, getting feedback and contributions back from the community. Uh, but it's not just the hobby thing nowadays. There are many companies going down the path for open source hardware. Um, and um, the problem with open source hardware is that unlike the software, 
you never know, is it really open source? <laughs> because with open source software, you can grab the software, you can build it, and you, you can run it. Most of the time, this happens uh, straightforward. Uh, with hardware, you have to manufacture it and then to understand, are these schematics really good to test them and so on. So uh, here's the entity, it's a legal entity from the United States called uh, Open Source Hardware Association. Maybe you're familiar with them. They have two things that they're doing. One is the Open Source Hardware Summit, which is happening in April and you can attend it virtually. And the second thing is that they're doing this open source hardware association certification problem, a program, which is free. So if you design open source hardware, you can submit it there uh, and uh, the association will inspect it to make sure that you are sharing everything that's needed for someone else to reproduce it. Then they'll certify it, provide you unique ID. The prefix of it is uh, the country code like here. I'm from Bulgaria, so it starts with BG. And after that, uh, kind of a number, an incremental number per, per each country. Um, the, the interesting thing is that each time when you do a new hardware revision, you have to go to the process again. And um, oops. And the important question here is, does it make any sense to use proprietary expensive tools, uh, software tools to design open source hardware? Uh, is it worth doing it? Can, the, can you expect anyone from the community to step in and help you if these software tools are hard to get, expensive, and so on? And the obvious answer is no, no, definitely no. There are far better tools, cut tools uh, on the market that ex ex uh, cost gazillions, and a lot of professionals, almost all the professionals use them, but actually it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're doing open source hardware. That's why a lot of companies nowadays are even switching to uh, free and open source software for designing open source hardware which also means that they're putting in money for the development and maintenance of this software products because open source doesn't necessarily mean free. It's free to use it in, in many cases, but development costs money, of course. Um, in order to make an open source hardware device, no matter if it's a mechanical keyboard or not, uh, we need the hardware, obviously. We need the software because without the software, the hardware is pretty much useless. Nowadays, everything has at least some kind of a firmware and of course, documentation. There are many uh, free and open source software tools for designing printed circuit boards. The one and only that's kind of high end compared to others is uh, KiCad or KiCad. Uh, I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. I always pronounce it some kind of wrong, but yeah, this is KiCad. Um, also, there are alternatives like Fritzing. Uh, I think you can design some very simple boards with Fritzing, but most of the time Fritzing is used for designing uh, makers schematics. Jira is an old software, but it's not as uh, well developed as KiCad as at the moment. There are many other tools that have been around there. I'm not sure how often they are used. And um, KiCad is my thing of choice. It's a free and open source um, software available on G under GPL version 3 plus license. It is cross-platform. So no matter what kind of uh, operating system you are running on your computer, you can use KiCad. It could be uh, Microsoft Windows. It could be Mac OS. And of course, it could be a GNU Linux distribution. I'm using it uh, on Ubuntu and it works pretty well. Um, so KiCad is a um, quite old project, more than 25 years of development. Um, and um, I'm, at, at the moment, I'm using KiCad 6, version 6. I think version seven was recently released. It has an integrated 3D viewer. Uh, last time I checked, uh, there were 32 copper layers um, available. This means that you can make a very complex uh, printed circuit boards uh, as long as someone can manufacture them because 32 layers is something that's hard to manufacture and expensive. Um, so KiCad is an open source product. There are a lot of companies and individuals contributing to KiCad. As an example, just as an example, I'm giving CERN because there are contributions from CERN developers. They started several years ago. They're not the only developers of KiCad. KiCad is not a project of CERN. Uh, by the way, I'm not affiliated with KiCad. I'm just user. I don't have any contributions to the source code for um, making the, the, the core things in KiCad. And um, you can download it and learn more at kiCad.org. Also, there is a section on the website uh, made with KiCad. So I've put a few things that I think represent uh, interesting examples of 
things made with KiCad. Over here, uh, there is um, a board. Uh, this is an ARM 64-bit board with Owner A64 by a company called Olimax. I don't know if you're familiar with this company, but they're my neighbors there. Uh, a few kilometers down this, <laughs> this direction down the road because they're based in Plovdiv. And that's actually how I got involved with KiCad. I'm a good friend with, uh, with a lot of people from Olimax. And um, several years ago, maybe it was seven years ago, um, they decided to switch from Ego to KiCad. Uh, they're making open source hardware, so they decided to use free and open source software tools to make their own boards. And the best thing is that when they started using KiCad, they started making their own libraries for footprints and so on. And they also made uh, workshops for the local community here in Bulgaria to share their experience, the things that they're going through um, with KiCad. And uh, Olimax have um, some very uh, experienced engineers. So it was interesting to learn things from them. And these were free public workshops. I've attended this type of workshops and that's how I started with, with KiCad. So I highly encourage you <laughs> to give a KiCad a try if you haven't done it yet. And uh, huge thanks uh, to Olimax because uh, uh, these are the guys who showed me the right path and I really enjoyed using KiCad. Um, they also made a, an open source hardware laptop. It's a do-it-yourself laptop. I have this laptop. It's actually in the other room. Uh, it's um, the, the hardware specifications are not impressive, but it's pretty cool because you buy it as a do-it-yourself kit and you can, you can assemble it with your bare hands and a, and, a, and a bunch of screwdrivers, of course. And here's another uh, laptop, which is also designed uh, with KiCad. It's uh, more powerful. It was released um, um, a couple of years ago at Crowd Supply, and it's made in Berlin. So it's a European uh, company behind it. Uh, uh, MNT Reform is the name of the laptop, MNT Research. Uh, is the laptop itself. And I've been following them in um, in uh, in the social media. They're working on new, new, really cool, complex open source hardware projects. So if they are not on your radar, I highly recommend you to uh, uh, have a sneak peek and uh, probably you're going to like what the things that they do. So here's an example of uh, uh, Olimax A64 in Maxinum uh, because it's a six layer printed circuit boards. Later on in the presentation, I'll be talking about mechanical keyboards that I do. And they're very simple boards, like with two, two layers. But if you want to see KiCad in action with uh, really uh, complex boards, here is an example. <laughs> this is a board with a single board computer, similar in size with Raspberry Pi. I think it's a little bit bigger, but it, just to, to have an idea for the dimensions, uh, this open source hardware, it's... Um, it's all available in GitHub. So a few months ago, I downloaded it, uh, took this screenshot, and this is the PCB view, and not, not a schematics, but uh, the, the whole PCB with all the layers. And uh, here on this side, you can see the layers. Here is this a closer look at um, the system on the chip, the Owner A64. So once again, I'm doing this just as a sample to show, hey, KiCad is a really powerful thing, and you can design really cool boards. Uh, uh, I've heard a lot of professionals using Altium, which costs gazillions to say, but KiCad can't do this and that. Yeah, probably uh, Altium still has some features that are not in KiCad yet, uh, but things are changing, things are moving forward. And uh, KiCad is a really powerful uh, software tool. It's not like uh, what it used to be uh, 10 or 20 years. It's an old project and it's in development. Um, so, the, the hard part for me actually is, is not designing the, the print circuit boards, it's rather designing a decent case for it. Uh, laser cutting, 3D printing, whatever your, is your favorite tool and approach, you need something to design the case. And sometimes uh, for low volume manufacturing, designing the case could be really tricky because you have to keep the price of the case uh, relatively low and you still need to have a manufacturing process that's easy enough and injection molding is Never an option for, for small scale project because uh, the, the initial investment is, is uh, really big. Um, so depending on the process what you, uh, that you would like to uh, manufacture the cases, you may uh, decide to use a different tool for designing the case. But um, 
If you like programming, OpenSCAD, there is also QCAD and FreeCAD, LibreCAD. Uh, Blender is, uh, well, it's uh, probably used for 3D modeling and animations. Um, it's very complex software. I don't know how to use it, but I've got some friends that are making really cool things. Uh, most of them are actually uh, highly skilled uh, graphical artists, but uh, they already have the skills for modeling. So sometimes they do models in Blender and after that 3D printing. If you're doing open source hardware, you need to put the things under version control. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of the people around here are uh, have a background of software engineers, software developers, and uh, I'm pretty sure all of us know how important version control is. The funny thing is that this is something relatively new for hardware engineers, and <laughs> they can make, I mean, professional hardware engineers. I'm, I'm uh, myself, I'm, I'm software engineer, so I'm, I've graduated from a technical university. I have some basic knowledge. Now I'm learning. Uh, I've been learning KiCad for several years now, maybe seven years. <laughs> I'm always learning. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in my core, I'm a software engineer. And for me, like version control is something that should start from day zero. If you're starting a hardware project, there is no problem to put it in, in Git. After that, to share the code in GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, wherever you want to. Don't forget about the documentation. <laughs> it's an important part of any open source project because if you ex expect anyone to come by to make some contributions, to make some changes, uh, to get started with the project, he needs uh, documentation. And the good documentation is uh, a great benefit for the project, uh, no matter if we're speaking about user documentation or uh, documentation um, uh, for manufacturing the things. Uh, actually, there is something interesting going on um, right now. In Germany, they like standards. So they are working on a specification by the Deutsche Institute for Normung uh, defining the standard uh, documentation of open source hardware. So uh, I'm not sure what, what this is going to end up doing. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the simple requirements that the Open Source Hardware Association has for certifying, certifying a project are straightforward. But um, if you, I'm pretty sure that this uh, is something that will bring benefit to the ecosystem as well. Um, so yeah, keep in mind that this is going ongoing development. Uh, so my first uh, project from scratch in KiCad was done uh, six years ago now, and this was a Raspberry Pi out of port for um, actually a hat. Uh, however, back then uh, the micro hat standard wasn't released. So <laughs> I made a micro hat. And I called it a fat because I believe at that time Pimoroni was doing similar uh, sized uh, sized boards called fats, and I put an EE prom with the device tree uh, uh, device tree binary overlay and all the specifications of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And several years later, the Raspberry Pi Foundation said that boards with this shape, this dimensions, and an EE prom should be called uh, micro hats. <laughs> so this is still a fat, but my new boards are actually micro hats. Um, I provided talks before, actually, in my previous uh, appearances, speaker, the Raspberry Pi pin, I also mentioned it. So once you get started with KiCad uh, or another tool for designing a printed circuit board, things become easier. <laughs> After that, the first time it's it's hard. After that, you know how it's done. You know the drill and it, it's easy to move on. So over the years, I have done uh, many products. <laughs> this is actually a small portion of them. And um, here is... Um, mechanical keyboard. However, this mechanical keyboard um, was created using Atmega 32U4AU. This is uh, the same chip uh, for a microcontroller that you can find on Arduino Leonard. I did it in 2020. Uh, 2020 was a hard year, as we all know. But 2021 was an awful year for um, electronics because there was a, there was a huge uh, chip shortage, which expanded to last year as well. Now things are getting better. So uh, at one moment I decided, hey, uh, I need to stop using this at Mega 32U4 because first, it's quite expensive. Second, it's very hard to get it. I'm buying uh, huge stocks whenever I found, or for two years I've been doing it. Now they're kind of, now this things are better. They're um, a bit available. But I was buying, like, if I found somewhere 100 units or 200 units, I'm just buying them because I don't know if I'll be able to keep manufacturing this. This was awful. 
And then the Raspberry Pi Foundation made an unexpected for me move. They uh, came up with the RP2040, which is actually great for mechanical keyboards. But before that, I would like to say that if you are coming from a software, from the software world, just as I did a few years ago, uh, keep in mind that hardware is hard, <laughs> like software. Uh, the hardware prototyping uh, is expensive because <laughs> you have to manufacture. Someone has to manufacture the board for you. There are people that are using CNC machines to make simple boards. That's also an option, but it takes time. Uh, sourcing components nowadays is hard. There's Things are getting better, but the, there is a, for a very long period, there was a severe chip shortage. Uh, often, um, the components are hard to assemble at home. So you, you might need to um, outsource this to a company, even for a prototype for a company to do it for you. However, uh, making hardware and making hardware prototypes is really fun. Uh, if you have been using a soldering iron, you know what I mean. Uh, but the soldering requires some skills and practice. Um, also the bugging use addi um, uh, requires additional tools, hardware tools. And fixing bugs means new hardware revisions. Testing hardware can be dangerous. Things can explode. <laughs> so keep in mind this as well. But it's possible to have open source hardware and people to contribute back. Um, here are um, some um, uh, hardware improvements um, which are done based on suggestions that I received, basically. Uh, sending this uh, in GitHub and after Sometimes someone comes by and say, hey, why don't you do it this way? Or, hey, there's a hardware bug. You should fix it the next revision. And um, yeah, that's, um, that's how it works. Uh, nothing is perfect. And uh, if something is not okay, you just go to the next revision, fix it. And um, in software, when you, you expect most of the contributions, especially in projects hosted in GitHub, uh, to come as GitHub pull requests. In hardware, it's a little bit tricky. So sometimes people are opening an issue, they're reporting what's going on. And after that, uh, I'm using the Git trailer suggested by to make sure that uh, this change has been implemented based on the suggestion and the feedback of a specific person. Uh, so for example, this is for the Raspberry Pi infrared uh, FAT that I've showed you that six years, ago, um, six years old and a year ago, a guy working for Google, <laughs> probably in his spare time, said, hey, you need to resist the hey, uh, this will improve the schematics. And um, this will make sure that the infrared LEDs uh, won't um, die after, if you put um, too high current uh, from, uh, on them. So I said, yeah, that makes sense. So let's do revision 1.1. And that's all public. It's uh, it's available in GitHub. It's available in the, in the history, in the Git uh, revision. Here's another thing uh, a friend of mine said, Hey, um, why don't you do it this way? Uh, he's a really good friend. We, we started together and said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. So here comes the Git trailer. And uh, if you are working on open source hardware, these are the benefits. You get feedback from the community. People come by and help you make things better. And the other way with um, open source hardware is that people can simply fork your project and make a different project. For example, the same friend that I've mentioned uh, decided that he wants the project that I've uh, showed you, the infrared fat, but with a relay. And so he removed the I2C uh, slots from it and up from the PCB and put a relay on top of it because he was uh, turning on and off something in his living room. I even forgot what was he controlling. Was it the hi-fi or something like this? And there's another project here a few years ago, maybe five years ago, there was a, a really nice guy from France who said, I really like your project. And I decided to make my own board based on this. Uh, it's with true whole components. So it's easier to prototype it at home. And uh, he shared this in GitHub. So these are the success stories of sharing hardware. Uh, of course, um, open source hardware comes under a license, but in order to be licensed by certified by the Open Source Hardware Association, the license should permit other people to make modify these things uh, and distribute them and even sell them. So it's um, the open source hardware license should be permissive so that other people can actually make and sell your things. And now we're coming to uh, mechanical keyboards. <laughs> actually, I've been talking too much about open source hardware, but uh, the main goal of this project is mechanical keyboards. And mechanical keyboards are interesting because 
most of the time, there are no standard keyboards. Yeah, you can have a keyboard like this. This is a 60% keyboard, kind of a staggered, uh, standard keyboard. Um, this is not an open source hardware keyboard. It's a Dicky. Uh, but um, you, you can also have um, awkwardly looking keyboards like this one that I created recently. You're going to see it in... Uh, uh, in, the, in the slides with the uh, with the schematics in KiCad, I quickly realized that 60% keyboards is not good enough for me, so I made a small mini mechanical keyboards with arrows. Uh, you can have a split keyboard. Uh, uh, you can have macro pads uh, for specific software. If you don't like uh, very complicated shortcuts, you can have uh, uh, these macro pads uh, configured, so you can you can uh, you know uh, use them for very specific. Um, features. Um, so things to consider when you're doing mechanical keyboards uh, and uh, these uh, things mean uh, understanding these things will explain why mechanical keyboards are so expensive. First, you need them, the print circuit board and uh, keyboards are big, which means there's uh, the, the, the print circuit board is bigger. <laughs> this means more expensive. The bigger size of the, the, the PCB, uh, the higher price you pay. You need a microcontroller uh, to so that you can connect the keyboard to your computer and control the um, control the the keys. Uh, RP twenty forty is a great fit for this. First of all, because it's available. Second, because it has a lot of GPIOs. And last but not least, it's very affordable. Uh, it it has built in USB, and uh, it's uh, significantly cheaper. Even a Raspberry Pi Pico. If you buy a Raspberry Pi Pico, it's cheaper than buying. Um, uh, just a, a single unit of Atmega uh, 34U4 by microchip, which is quite expensive. I know that you can find um, um, some Arduino Leonardo with this uh, chip uh, in AliExpress for almost nothing. <laughs> but actually, if you go to Mauser or Farno, <laughs> the, the the price for a single Atmega is like around five US dollars, and you have to buy USB, uh, an oscillator, a bunch of resistors, and so on. And with Raspberry Pi Pico, you have all this on a print circuit board, like on a, on a module. And other alternative boards that we're going to have a look at later on. After that, we need the mechanical switches. And if you want to do a hot swappable uh, mechanical keyboard, uh, you will also need hot swappable sockets. I'm a huge fan about uh, of the hot swappable sockets. Here is an example on, on this, oops, sorry, uh, on this keyboard. You can just disassemble the key and you can change it. And uh, in the next slide, I'll explain you why that's so cool. Um, so we have the key caps. The key caps are the things above the switches. And uh, last but not least, actually the most important part is the software and the firmware. Uh, here's a closer look at the mechanical switches. Uh, Cherry MX is like the gold standard for mechanical switches. Actually, how many of you are using mechanical uh, keyboards? Can you raise your hands if you're using a mechanical keyboard? Are you into this? All right, I see two people raising their hands. Well, um, so I'll briefly explain here that um, Ch Cherry MX is, um, the gold standard, but there are many uh, manufacturers uh, later on, I'll show you a list. Uh, they have different colors. Depending on the color, they have different mechanical char uh, characteristics, uh, the speed, the loudness of the key. And um, it, it's it's whole science <laughs> just to figure out what kind of a, a switch you want. And as of today, if you're buying or building a mechanical keyboard, I highly recommend you to get a KO hot swappable sockets because they're easy to assemble with SMT. Uh, this is the surface mount technology. And um, after that, uh, you can change your um, switches. Because sometimes, for example, uh, beginners for mechanical keyboards prefer, most of the time prefer blue uh, switches, but these switches are very loud. And if you buy a keyboard with so, such uh, loud um, switches, if someone else is in the room, you you'll get really nervous. So at one moment you might want to, to swap the, the switches to something more silent or quicker. And uh, with a hot swappable socket, uh, you have the freedom to do it. Keep in mind that the uh, hot swappable sockets have um, certain um, certain lifespan. You can uh, do it up to 100 
uh, changes. That's according to the data sheet by Kale. Actually, I have a YouTube video with more details about the sockets if you're interested in. Um, so th this is uh, Cherry MX. This is the gold standard, as I mentioned, in switches, the most popular switches, not the only one, but the most popular. Cherry is the name of the brand. MX is the model. Uh, they contain the, all these parts here. We have the upper part, uh, the contacting part, the switch, and the base part. The base part is the thing that either goes in the hot swappable socket or uh, directly on the PCB, depending on the design that you do. There are many other manufacturers. Gateron, Kale, they do uh, Cherry MX compatible switches. And actually on the, the, the boards that I do, this board and other boards, I'm using Gateron switches, red switches. They're really good. Um, and there are other... Uh, vendors that are making different uh, switches with different shapes, which means that when you're designing a board, depending on the switches that you have in mind to use, you should find uh, an appropriate footprint to put on the PCB. And in, if you're not sure, uh, go for Cherry MX. That's, that's my suggestion. And uh, on top of that, you have the keycap. Uh, here you have the freedom to experiment. There are so many cool keycaps people are manufacturing, making. Uh, even handmade um, uh, keycaps. It's amazing. And um, there's just a small collection of uh, funky keycaps that you can put on top of your Ch Cherry MX switches. And now um, I've already mentioned on many occasions Raspberry Pi RP2040 dual core arm, but I believe it, uh, uh, it should have a, a separate slide. So we have this microcontroller, it's a game changer because of the price and because it's available in a period where chips were not available. Uh, we have it on the Raspberry, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. The problem here is that it's with uh, micro USB and most of the keyboard enthusiasts like USB-C and the, the whole world is going to USB-C. I don't know why the Raspberry Pi Foundation made it with micro USB. Probably they will release soon a new version with uh, USB-C, but it is what it is. However, there are other companies making similar modules and development boards with um, with, with USB-C. There's one from uh, uh, from Adafruit. There's another one for from uh, SparkFun, and there is one from Seed Studio. Uh, this one. This is the Xiao module. Um, the the thing about Xiao is that it has the, basically Seed Studio is doing this series of Xiao modules that are using different microcontrollers with different capabilities, even with the ESP32 C3 but they are all in the same form factor, uh, which means uh, that for Raspberry Pi RP2040, we have significantly less GPIO pins compared to what we have on the Raspberry Pi Pico. That's not so cool if you're developing a huge, uh, a huge keyboard. It's a showstopper. However, for a mini mechanical keyboard, like these keyboards that I'm doing, it's perfectly fine. And it has USB-C and it has a new pixel <laughs> built in. So um, these three keyboards, uh, uh, is some, uh, are, were made by me last year. I successfully crowdfunded them with crowd supply. Um, uh, the first two are just knobs. So you rotate them to control the volume. And this one is with hot swappable keys and uh, rotary encoder. That's not, the, by the way, a lot of people think this is a potentiometer. No, it's a digital, it's a rotary encoder. And um, so how is the design? All of them are actually uh, uh, open source hardware. Um, the case is super simple. They're just uh, uh, acrylic cases that are stacked together as a sandwich. Uh, and the PCB is designed in KiCad. So when you start a new project with KiCad, mm, the, uh, the first thing is to, to design the schematics. After that, you have to assign footprints for each component of the schematics. Uh, so here on the left, you see a screenshot of KiCad with a schematic of a simple keyboard. Actually, this is the keyboard that I'm using right now during this presentation and it still doesn't have a case it's a work in progress <laughs> and uh, here on the right you see uh, properties of a, of a symbol this is the the first um, software um, uh, the, the first switch the first key um, and here the important part is that I have selected a specific footprint and this is the KL socket MX as I've explained previously this is uh, the hot swappable socket uh, compatible with Cherry MX. So for each of the components on the schematics, I have to assign a footprint. And after assigning the footprint, I should um, I should 
um, have everything done, and then I have to export it into the PCB view to generate the netlist and export it to the PCB view. So this is the actual um, design of the board. Uh, this is where we cut uh, the edges so that we can have the final the final thing done. Uh, so when you are making a, um, any kind of a print circuit board with KiCad, uh, there are two steps. Step number one is to do the schematics. And step number two is to do the design in the uh, PCB view editor. Um, so one uh, interesting thing that I've discovered for um, mechanical keyboards is that actually when you do the mechanical keyboard, it becomes big. <laughs> it's a big board and the ground plates are becoming big and it's hard to, to heat them in order to, um, to assemble the, the mechanical keyboard, especially if you are uh, using uh, lead-free uh, soldering techniques. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, so the solution for this and I've, I've done it for this, this board over here and some and uh, this board as well for pretty much all my new boards, is to use this hatched pattern for the, the zones. And when you put ground, you do this hatch pattern and it reduces the, uh, uh, the overweight of the board and the, the, of the, of the uh, ground plates on the top and uh, on the back. And this is a really cool trick if you're designing a printed circuit board. This was not supported in KiCad 5, but it's supported in KiCad 6. And since, since I switched to KiCad 6 last year, I can take advantage of this. Um, so this is the hardware side of things. Um, after the presentation, I'll be happy to answer some questions. I'm sure there'll be uh, more questions about the hardware, but let's talk about uh, quickly talk about the firmware. The hardware without a firmware is nothing. And in order to make the keyboard work, you need uh, you need an appropriate firmware. Luckily, there are so many open source firmwares out there. The most popular is Quantum Mechanical Keyboard Firmware, also known as QMK. Until recently, RP2040 wasn't supported there, but probably um, like six months ago, or even a little bit more than six months ago, uh, QMK was ported to RP2040 and you can use it. It's written in C, so you build a binary, you flush it on your RP2040 um, keyboard, and you're good to go. Uh, but uh, in the Raspberry Pi community, Python is super popular. So there is an alternative, and it's called KMK. Uh, this is a clackety uh, keyboard powered by CircuitPython. So basically, first you upload CircuitPython on the RP2040, and after that, you upload KMK. Um, KMK firmware um, is open source. As I mentioned, it's written in CircuitPython. The source code is available in GitHub under GPL v3 license. Uh, and uh, from day one, it supports uh, Raspberry Pi uh, RP2040, the Raspberry Pi Pico, and these uh, C Studio Xiao modules that I'm using. Uh, so all the keyboards that I do nowadays, out of the box, come with, um, uh, I mean, all the keyboards with RP2040 for the moment come out of the box with the, the KMK firmware. I'm really keen on this project. Uh, it's not as big as QMK, uh, so um, it's more flexible, I have to say. And uh, the maintainers are doing a really good job. And if you do a keyboard, or if you're starting with keyboards, I uh, highly recommend you to have a look at the QMK, especially if you have a keyboard that supports the microcontroller this keyboard supports, so you can find them. Um, and I think we are near the end of the time frame for my talk, so let's wrap it up with conclusions. I spent quite a lot of time talking about open source hardware. So just to, to wrap it up saying once again, uh, open source hardware is really cool. So if you're thinking about uh, getting started with hardware, definitely do it the open source uh, uh, hardware way. Nowadays, there are uh, high quality free and open source software tools for designing PCBs like KiCad. Um, the established open source um, um, software development workflows can be adapted uh, pretty easily, actually, uh, to, to the hard hardware uh, products. And you can uh, have a real benefit out there if you're already a software engineer moving to the hardware world. So don't be afraid, grab the soldering guide or give it a try. Even if it doesn't work from the first time, give it a try. Sooner or later, you get it working. And if it's open source, you can attract more people to help you work on the project. Uh, mechanical keyboards are also a fun thing. Uh, they're expensive because they have many uh, components, as you have seen. Uh, it's a whole ecosystem 
uh, we can talk with ours uh, about these keyboards. Uh, so uh, if you are uh, if you haven't tried a mechanical keyboard yet, start with a mini mechanical keyboard or uh, and um, carry on. And um, once again, I have to say Raspberry Pi RP2040 is a great fit for mechanical keyboards, not only for mechanical keyboards, but specifically for mechanical keyboards. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> I really enjoy this microcontroller. And uh, here are some useful uh, links. Uh, Richard probably uh, should uh, share the slides after the talk. Uh, somehow uh, I'll get with you over email to, to arrange this. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thanks very much. <clears throat> it's very interesting. I did have a question about, um, so if, when you're first starting with KiCad and going open source, you know, I guess what are the, the main tips to, or mistakes should you make or would you warn us about not making? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of mistakes that you should do, but the cool thing about uh, KiCad is that before you um, run, uh, before you make your, uh, so how it works actually, you do the schematics first. After that, that uh, you select the footprints, each footprint should have, each component should have a, a unique ID, and then you run a check. It's an automatic check, but if there is something, really basic mistake, if you have forgotten something, and uh, this happens all the time, you know. Uh, KiCad will say, hey, wait a minute, fix this. You want to fix it. And then you go to the PCB view where you mm, make the, uh, the actual outline of the board. Uh, one cool thing that I do, actually, I have an example here, is that the, after making the board, uh, before placing an order, uh, the company to manufacture it for you. There, there are many companies. I, actually, I didn't mention this, but there are many companies out there uh, even in, in Europe, in the UK, in, in the US, you have uh, Osh, uh, Oshpark, uh, and also in China, like PCBWay, JLPCB, OPCB, they're ready to make ports for you. However, um, no matter how fast shipping you're going to select, it will take at least a few days. So what I do is actually to print something like this. This is uh, a sheet of paper. <laughs> I cut it. And after that, you see this... Uh, this piece of paper, and here is the board. <laughs> so this uh, kind of, uh, you know, helps me to better understand, is it, are the things fitting together? Because especially with mechanical keyboards, uh, you have to make sure that there's enough space between the, the, the keys that things are uh, ergonomic and um, matches your expectation. So uh, printing a small piece of uh, paper, <laughs> Uh, the PCB on small piece of paper. I know it sounds childish, but sometimes helps. And uh, the other thing is that uh, KiCad has a 3D viewer, so you can have a look at the 3D viewer to get understanding of the of the uh, dimensions. Because when you're designing with KiCad or any CAD software, you can zoom in and you can zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> and when you zoom, everything looks big. But after that, when you zoom out, uh, things might not fit that well. Yeah, I like, I like the idea of the paper, actually. It's a good, uh, it's a good way of doing it. So I, I do find even when I'm doing like this, uh, a proto board, you don't actually think about how things are actually all fit together. <clears throat> Sometimes you find yourself mechanically uh, with a problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, any other questions? No, Carl, you've got your hand up. I think, I think that's all. Yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering if you knew much about the Fritzing project. If you, you it kind of looks like it's trying to do the same thing as KiCad, like with open hardware uh, and build a, a tool for developing these, these boards. I was just wondering if you knew about that. Uh, yes, uh, I know that they're doing it. However, I'm not... Um... I'm, I'm, I'm not informed about the details. I, uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, used uh, Fritzing for quite some time. And back in the days when I was using it more frequently, I was just doing this type of, uh, mm, this type of uh, um, um, just schematic maker schematics to show how to attach a sensor to sure. Raspberry Pi or something like this. I know that after that, uh, the project has it had some bumpy years because in... 
2020, I think, there was a talk about Fritzing at Fosdem. And the people there were explaining that uh, Fritzing wasn't well maintained. They were searching a contact how to move I, on forward. And I think I they had, did it. I had bug problems with it. Like, like it kept crashing when I was trying to audition it. Uh, um, I, I, I guess like I, I think Fritzing is capable only of making like a single or a two layer boards two layer board what? don't get me wrong two layer board is uh, the board like I do for the keyboards it's more than enough for a keyboard mm. but um, if you're getting started I recommend you to put a little bit more efforts but to start with KiCad because you can sure. do boards on multiple layers Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Mr. Anthony, you have your hand up. You want to ask a question? Um, yeah. Um, my question is about the sort of the the MMI side of it. Um, everybody loves mechanical keyboards, and I can I can kind of get that for when. Um, they're used for uh, typing on a full board and you're going really fast. But do we know anything much about what it is we love about them? Yes, we love the feel, but why do we love that feel? And, and in particular, what's the advantage with uh, these, these small three and four button boards that you've shown, where it's just an occasional press of a, of a, of a macro key and, and speed doesn't really come into it? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question and really hard hard to answer because different people have different expectations for mechanical keyboards, and it's hard to summarize it. I would say that the mechanical keyboards give you the freedom to experiment. There are so many different mechanical keyboards out there. Uh, we have split keyboards. Uh, we have ergonomic uh, uh, or to linear keyboards because uh, historically the staggered keyboards that we I'm using a standard keyboard like this one uh, on my on my desk, but it's a standard keyboard, right? Just a 60% keyboard. Um, the standard keyboard historically are uh, coming from the typing machines. Uh, is this name in English typing machine? Uh, so um, the people were used to uh, to type this way, and when the computers came, they just took the keyboards as they are. But uh, you see how they. The, the, the keys are not below each other and there are auto linear keyboards where you have a matrix of keys uh, and for people that are heavily typing, they say, I haven't tried it yet, it's on my to-do list but there are a lot of people saying that uh, people that are uh, heavily, heavily, heavily typing all the day that auto linear keyboard are more ergonomic and provide them faster speed in terms of um, um, typing and uh, the same for uh, split keyboards there are split keyboards uh, provide you uh, the flexibility that you have le your left hand and right hand uh, uh, from uh, not, not like this, but with a little bit space between them. And about the second question about the, the macro keys, uh, no, they're, they're not useful for quick typing, obviously, because you have just a few keys out there. Uh, they're uh, most of the time they're use, um, useful uh, when you have specific software and you would like to have a single click of a button to execute several actions. Um, the, the first time I needed it was actually uh, during the pandemic where a lot of events like this event and other events were moving to, to virtual events. And at one moment I was supposed to go to a conference, but the conference was uh, was uh, uh, was switched to, to a virtual conference. So instead of going there, I had to make a recording. And I've installed OBS and OBS is uh, quite complex software and I don't have a team of people switching cameras and so on. So uh, I figure out that I need to make a few, um, a, a few uh, views so that I can have uh, one view for my face and the whole camera, another view for, for the presentation, one that combines it all together. And uh, I can easily switch between two, these two views while I'm talking. And that's how uh, I started out with these uh, simple macro pads because I needed something. Uh, for example, here on this board, I have a potentiometer, which is pretty cool for um, controlling the volume and this type of small things that can make your life easier from time to time. 
Of course, uh, mechanical keyboards are not for uh, not for everyone. There are specific use cases where they where they make sense. They're fun, but sometimes they don't make sense, and it's not necessarily to use them in these cases. Cool. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Leon. That's uh, really cool. Really enjoyed that. Thank lots you. Of good information there. Lots of good links at the end there as well. Thanks. Thank you for having me, and I hope you had fun. Certainly did. Thank you very much. All right.